I want to welcome everybody to the Ojai Foundation. It's lovely to see so many old and new faces. When I was asked to introduce Terence, I wondered what on earth to say. <laughs> so I, um, I thought back to when we first met. And that was at Esalen Institute in uh, the spring of 1983. And I'd been living there for about nine months, recovering from a nervous breakdown, which occurred here. And, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was certainly getting better at that point. I was walking again. And Paul Herbert, uh, who was the sound person at uh, Esalen at that time, said, Leon, you have to come and do this workshop. I had done absolutely nothing at Esalen except sort of recuperate and he insisted that I come to your program so I did and uh, the program itself is a sort of blur of Lacherera, flying sources, mushrooms, electronic intelligences, it's just a total blur, he, he spoke man spoke for like I don't know how many hours and I was who is this person i would never met anybody like this before <laughs> the one part of the program that I remember clearly it's interesting was in the introductions you know everybody goes around and says why did you come and that sort of thing and Kat said something that just stuck, uh, stuck with me and she said, I like his style. And at the time, I thought she was talking about your shades or your <laughs> socks, you know. <laughs> but um, afterwards, you know, I saw more of what she was referring to in a kind of deeper way. And after the program bag of presents uh, in my hand, and that changed my life. So he's one of those people, a very few, a handful of people that I can say have really, um, I've met at a crossroads of my life. And for that, I'm, I've always been very grateful, I truly have. So, I like your style too. <laughs> and, and some people. Great introduction, man. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and a tough act to follow. Before we get into this, what time is lunch, Lola? <laughs> one o'clock? So we'll go till one? Or, or if you want to have time, you can walk around. Go till 12.30 then? Good. Can everybody here in the back... Uh, without amplification? Good. Well, if I get tired and begin to mumble, why bring me back up? Yeah. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is sort of a nostalgic return. I can't even remember. The last Ojai event was at Camp Shalom. I can't remember. It must have been three years since we were all together here under the teaching tree. In some ways, a lot of water over the dam. In other ways, uh, five minutes ago, uh, I just come from two days of speaking in Los Angeles to large audiences which demand a sort of formal intensity that you thankfully relieved me of this morning. Uh, <clears throat> I guess uh, the... Well, how many people are familiar with my books or have been to workshops in the past? Is there anybody who's just utterly unfamiliar? Uh huh. <laughs> okay. Well, so there's, we'll work from that benchmark out. Um, I never imagined that I would end up sitting in this position and pontificating on the nature of life and history and 
global human destiny. I uh, I started out simply with an, uh, a love of nature. I was uh, persecuted as a child in my physical education classes, so I spent a lot of time on my own. And I grew up in western Colorado where there is a lot of exposed sedimentary rock and some of it has dinosaurs pressed into it. And I could always feel these dinosaurs. Uh, the largest dinosaur ever found was found a few years ago near Delta, Colorado, about 30 miles from where I grew up. And all the time I was growing up, I knew that sucker was out there. <laughs> and I, but I could never walk to it. Uh, if I could have, probably my career would have taken a different turn. But uh, my interest in fossils, I remember I had an uncle who gave me a book when I was about eight years old of fossils. And it had one of those charts in the front of it where it shows uh, five billion years and then the last half inch is expanded to the next column and then the last half inch is expanded to the next column and so I saw that human history was a hairline crack at the bottom of the column furthest to the right and I got the concept of how old, not the universe, but the Earth is. And it was a dizzying perspective. The town I grew up in, if you read Time magazine, you were persecuted as a left-wing intellectual. <laughs> uh, the town I grew up in... Uh, once made it into Ripley's Believe It or Not as a place that had more Christian churches per capita than any town of its size in the United States. This was a town of 1,600 people with 42 Christian churches <laughs> thriving. Uh, uh, when I was a kid, I thought street corners were four churches. <laughs> I didn't know you could have buildings uh, on street corners that weren't churches. And uh, I would go up these dry arroyos with my rock pick looking for fossil shells and, uh, and dinosaur bones and... Uh, and this sort of thing, brachiopods, and in the in the solitude, because I would often not be able to con my little friends into attending me, because they learned quickly that it was hotter out there than decent people could tolerate. And also, I have to confess, I whenever I invited someone to come along, it was with the thought that they would carry back the specimen. So they were essentially pack burrows <laughs> for my fossil expedition. And, uh, and then I had an uncle who was an old rock hound, and he introduced me to the concept of uh, not splitting apart strata to see ancient forms of life, but slicing rocks up and polishing them to reveal the light and the color and sometimes the crystal cavities that were hidden inside them. And so very early on I got this idea that the surface of things is not where attention should rest, that uh, you have to, as uh, Ahab tells Starbuck in Moby Dick, you have to seek the little lower layer, and under the surface of things is uh, another reality, a reality that reaches, in some cases, back to the birth of the planet, practically, or in other cases, uh, 
in other dimensions. I had uh, a fixation with meteorites at one time, and butterflies, and rocketry, and all of these things were about uh, a certain thrill, a certain iridescence that could be coaxed out of physical phenomena if you would not just simply dismiss them and pass over them. And as a little kid, I, uh, I had very bad eyes. I still do, but I wear contact lenses. But at that time, I wore very thick bifocal lenses. And my mother, bless her heart, she was cut from somehow different cloth than all the people around me, uh, read Aldous Huxley's book, The Art of Seeing, which I had an occasion to look at it in the past year. And I was amazed how much of my own attitude toward life is contained in this fairly trivial book. You know, Huxley had terrible eyes, too. And he um, discovered the so-called Batesian method of eye exercises and, and eye health, uh, which at that time, we're talking 1954 or so, was completely sky blue crackpot type stuff. I mean, this was the Eisenhower era. And uh, the exercises that I learned when my mother took me to this, uh, I guess you would say, Batesian uh, therapist uh, were exercises in attention in attention to the exterior world. And then the other form of exercise was uh, what the rest of American society wasn't going to encounter for 15 years and then would encounter as Buddhist visualization. But for us, it was just close your eyes and the therapist would create capsules in the air through narrative and it was an eye exercise. And so I, it introduced me to the idea of sitting still and watching what's going on behind closed eyelids. What fascinated me about the butterflies was the physical iridescence, which in the northern hemisphere is fairly rare in butterflies. You only get it in these little blue lysineas that you see fluttering around mud puddles uh, in dry areas. I've seen them here. But of course, in the tropics, iridescence uh, becomes a more generalized phenomenon, not only in butterflies, but in beetles as well. And uh, I had the ability to fixate on these things could spend hours with a single pyrite crystal or a single beetle carcass, just turning it over and looking at it. Uh, and then, uh, at some point, again, Huxley keeps coming back into this, I uh, decided that I would become uh, a writer, not because I loved writing particularly, but because I admired uh, all the attention that great writers seemed to have heaped upon them, which was something that I, as a goggle-eyed weirdo, was not getting much of. And I, so then the name Huxley recurred again, and I started reading through all of those novels, the, the social novels, you know, Antiquay and Chrome Yellow, After Many a Summer Dies the Swan, and all the rest of it, uh, Ape and Essence. And finally, I came to a work of nonfiction by Huxley, The Doors of Perception and Heaven and Hell. And this was by now uh, probably 1958. I was 14 years old. And in that book, Huxley, 
the quintessential English academic establishment intellectual describes his uh, confrontations with Mescaline and what it meant to him. And it was fascinating to me because previously all I had ever known or heard about drugs was what I had learned from reading Huxley's novel, Brave New World, which is a, a, a pharmacological dystopia, if there ever was one, and has lots to say to society today, I think. If you haven't read it, I recommend it to you. If you have read it, you recall that it was a society of people, perfect people, grown in bats, who died early, but who never lost the bloom of their youth, who were herd-minded, driven by advertising, and entirely dependent for their happiness and psychic equilibrium on a drug called Soma. And they had little advertising slogans which they would repeat by rote if anyone displayed inappropriate anger or emotion. A gram is better than a dam, they would display to public uh, drug sound proposition. Here is this same author writing of mescaline and reaching for metaphors drawn from Meister Eckhart, St. John of the Cross, John Chrysostom, comparing the, the light falling into the folds of his trousers to the light of Caravaggio and Duccio and Fra Angelico. And um, I was amazed. I had never heard such carryings on. Well, now, if you go back and look at uh, the doors of perception, you realize that this was not an extravagant telling of the nature of the psychedelic dimension. It was, in fact, a fairly conservative rendering, a description of uh, low-dose, eyes-open, thoughty psychedelic voyaging. I mean, it's been a long, long time since I've set a stack of Abrams art books by my left knee before I take a psychedelic. But back then, that was how it was done. And you looked at the visible world. Well, so then, around this time, there began to be alarmist uh, articles in the press about the abuse of blue morning glory seeds by some of the more uh, crazed and unassimilated members of uh, American society. And I immediately tore out and purchased a couple of packets of blue morning glory seeds. And, uh, and, uh, and then noticed that uh, the leaves imprinted in the fabric of the drapes in the living room all seem to have little faces who were <laughs> dancing. This was, in fact, clearly the intent of the designer, but something that in all the years of living around these ratty drapes, I had never <laughs> noticed. And then I began to look at everything around me and discovered that this affinity for looking into things that my rock hunting, butterfly collecting uh, habits had instilled in me had become like turbocharged. And swimming in the depths of polished stones, ponds, the ditch running down the back of the backyard were myriads of worlds. And I went outside and I was looking around at everything and then I, I just felt physically overcome. My knees basically gave way underneath me and I sat down under a tree and I closed my eyes and my life has never been the same since because there, waiting behind closed eyelids were, uh, you know, 
ruined cities covered with creeping jeweled lichens and uh, inhabited by shining eyed creatures that were I was not sure exactly what and much much more and I just spent a half hour or so literally in trance gazing into this unfolding reverie of desert jungles, machines, archaeological artifactria, machines in orbit around alien worlds, all of this stuff. And uh, I was stunned. I still am stunned. And that essentially set the compass for my, uh, the rest of my intellectual life. I didn't understand, really, what had happened. In other words, I didn't clearly get it that this was a trip and that it was induced by the psychedelic. I understood something of that, but I thought also it must be unique. It must be my mood, my expectation. Or surely this cannot happen on demand through the simple act of eating morning glory seeds being sold at 35 cents a pack down at the hardware store. Um, and so then I began to ask questions. And I quickly began to ask questions. And I quickly discovered it was a mistake. So I went to Huxley and read more carefully saw that he was working from the early of Havelock Ellis, Weir Mitchell, um, Fitzhugh Ludlow. Uh, it turned out that this whole tradition, albeit an underground tradition in Western intellectual or aesthetic sense, based around the perturbation of consciousness with substances. Uh, Coleridge comes to mind as an example and uh, you may know his poem Kublai Khan Kublai Khan was written in a flash basically based on an opium reverie Coleridge was uh, an aficionado laudanum which was a, a tinctured form of opium that had a great vogue in the 19th century. Well, I knew nothing about opium or laudanum or the style of the 19th century English intelligentsia, but in the lines of Kublai Khan, I could feel this same siren song iridescence that had been in the pyrite crystal in the butterfly wings, uh, in the beetle bodies. Uh, here, let's go out on a limb and really take a chance here. In Xanadu did Kublai Khan a stature dome decree where out the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. So twice five miles of fertile ground with walls and towers girdled round and there blossomed many an incense-bearing tree. Five miles meandering with a mazy motion the sacred river ran. And it goes on and on and then it says it was a miracle of rare device a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice. And that notion, not the sunny pleasure dome itself, but the notion of a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice introduced me to the concept of what's called in alchemy coincidentia positorum, where two things which are mutually exclusive are juxtaposed in a way which creates a shock in the mind, a poetic shock that is then potentially memorable. Years later, I used this effect to uh, 
title my book. So that's why you get the invisible landscape, true hallucination. See, this is uh, all hideously contrived. <laughs> well, eventually, and after many adventures too painful to recall, I ended up at Berkeley in the fall of 1965, with that in the fall of 1965, which was what an incredibly, probably the most together thing I've ever achieved with my life in terms of domain, because I was neither early nor late. I was not 10 miles off or a thousand miles off. I was dead on. I was right at the very center of the flowering of the cultural revolution that is now vilified and fondly recalled as the 1960s. And uh, I was living in a ratty room house in San Francisco that summer before going over to Berkeley. And there was a guy living across the hall from me who uh, replaced all the white light bulbs in his apartment with red light bulbs and painted his windows black and played the made chords of freight train on his slack guitar over and over again. And uh, he went on to glory as uh, Barry Melton the lead guitarist of Country Joe and the Fish. And I didn't know it, but at the time they were in the studio laying down the tracks for uh, electric music for the mind and the body, which was one of the defining freak albums of that era. And he introduced me to uh, the joys of cannabis and further to something called Sandos LSD, which was uh, going around in these little tiny double O capsules. And uh, it was as if the previous Morning Glory vision had now been lifted to a whole other level of intensity. And everyone around me was undergoing these kinds of experiences. And there was a sense of incredibly accelerated change. You could palpably feel the acceleration of change seemed to be in the water, in the air. Uh, once I moved to Berkeley, I, I noticed that the large billboard that they changed for Telegraph Avenue every 30 days contained cryptic messages uh, that were inevitably addressed to me and my uh, affinity group. Uh, in short, serious boundary dissolution and category and scramblement was creeping into my uh, mental universe. And then, after about six months of this, I had a very strange friend who lived in Palo Alto. He, uh, he still is my great inspiration. I wish I could coax him into public display because he's the real Terence McKenna. <laughs> but if you're the real Terence McKenna, you have too much good taste to ever do what I do. <laughs> so, uh, but he came to me. His, his style was to, to get there first, whatever it was, to do it, to reject it, and to be absolutely contemptuous of it by the time anybody else even <laughs> arrived at the scene of the crime. So in early 1967, he came to my house in Berkeley one rainy February night, and he said, uh, something you might be interested in. And I said, what's that? And he said, uh, this is a material that has been boosted from an army research project being run down at SRI 
and someone managed to get a 50-gallon drum of this material out of the inventory without anybody knowing. And I said, what is it? And he said, it's called DMT. And I said, it's a psychedelic drug, right? And he said, right. And I said, how long does it last? And he said, three minutes. And I said, no problem, bring it on. <laughs> because after all, I had been assaulted by Life magazine on the subject of LSD, and I had gotten that under my belt, and I was by now uh, relatively sophisticated about cannabis. I figured there were probably no more frontiers to cross. And uh, so we sat down then and there and uh, did it. And about 15 seconds after toking up on this stuff, I found myself plunged into an elf nest somewhere on the other side of the universe. In other words, there were, um, and thank God no one fills in for me because they know it so well. Uh, <laughs> Jewel self-dribbling basketballs. Did I get it right? <laughs> Jewel self-dribbling basketballs that came bounding toward me from all corners of this domed underground space. Well, I had been used to hallucinations acceleration of thought, funny ideas, strange insights, hysterical waves of giggling, so forth and so on. I had never seen anything like what I was now face to face with. And also, whatever this substance was, it didn't affect me. It didn't affect my perception of who I was. In other words, it seemed to me that the drug wasn't working, it was simply that the world had disappeared and been replaced by something else. And I was still who I had been a few moments before, except now I was fairly alarmed by what had just happened to the architecture and geography of uh, Southern Telegraph <laughs> Avenue. And these, uh, these things, there was an overwhelming sense of Affection, involvement, a sense that I hadn't experienced since being six years old and being released on Christmas morning to run out to the Christmas tree. And there was a sense of childlike innocence under conditions of extraordinary alienness and unfoldment. And just, I was boggled, the mind boggled. I at last understood the real meaning of this uh, uh, new cliché at that time. And these things were making objects with their voices. They were singing in this unearthly, crystalline, punning, elf chatter kind of language. But it was not something simply heard. It was something which I could see. I could see syntax unfolding like ribbons being spewed out of machines, shooting across my visual field, rolling into balls, condensing as objects with rotating crystalline facets and machined interiors of gold and ivory and chrysolite. And these objects were themselves emitting strange singing language-like noises. And the whole thing was happening at an enormous speed, almost like a Bugs Bunny cartoon run backwards at about three times ordinary speed. Well, I barely had time to take all of this in and, you know, assure myself that I wasn't dying before it collapsed the way 
a tent collapses, the way an ice cream cone melts, the way an erection disappears, the way an investment goes bad. It just was gone. And uh, my friend, I was sitting there, I opened my eyes, and my friend said, so what do you think? <laughs> and I was... Uh, I was... Uh, Done. I've never actually seen it hit anybody quite as hard as it hit me. I, for about 15 minutes, all I could say was, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I can't believe that. I can't believe that. It's, you, call that you call that a drug? <laughs> you, you must be nuts. Drugs don't do that. I mean, drugs speed you up, slow you down, make you fall down, stuff like that. This is no drug. It's magic. It masquerades as a drug. It's a doorway into another world. I kept having the image of Aladdin's lamp, my favorite fairy tale, and I felt like Aladdin. You know, you buy something in a junk shop, you take it home, you try to clean it up, the next thing you know, a flame a mile high pours out and demands to do your bidding. That was the impression I had. And it's the impression I still have. That must have been early 1966, 66, 76, 86. What is it, 36 years ago? That's not possible. 26 years ago. Nothing has particularly changed. Nothing has ever surpassed it. And it, for me, that was the moment that set my auto compass for life. I mean, I said, this I must understand. Not only did my mother not tell me and my father not tell me, but Aldous Huxley never told me, and neither did John of the Cross, and neither did Meister Eckhart. All those people were apparently flying at a lower altitude than I, 19-year-old brat in ratty rented room, have been able to achieve in the last 15 minutes. Uh, and so then I began to look for this, or for some trace of it, in the history of uh, uh, human philosophy, in the history of art, in um, ethnography, everywhere. And I really didn't find it. And I really still don't find it except there are certain faint, faint footprints in the blowing sand of human experience that if you know, if you've seen the vision, you can follow these footprints back to something like this source. First of all, I, I went to the library. No, of none of the heads that I knew could make any sense out of this at all. For them, LSD defined the top of the ladder. Well, this, with this stuff, LSD and being at the local PTA this stuff, LSD and being at the local PTA meeting down seem to be two states of mind to merge together on some distant horizon of straightness. So I went to the library and began reading more intensely in a more focused fashion. <coughs> and I learned that in South America there were five people who apparently utilized plants that had this stuff in it. Now, at that time, this was 67, this was new information, information that had arrived uh, in the domain of, of botanical scholarship really in the previous five to ten years through the work of people like Richard Evan Schultes at Harvard and uh, William Safford and other people had uh, described this chemical. 
being present in these aboriginal intoxicants. So far as I could tell, no academic had ever done it because no description matched what I had experienced. And when I discussed this with my friend who had brought me to this place, he said that he felt that probably uh, it was impossible to attain these kinds of concentrations outside the laboratory. And that meant, if true, that these shamanic practitioners and societies that were utilizing this were utilizing it but that they themselves had no real awareness of what it was potentially like when concentrated through modern analytical and laboratory techniques. So I, uh, it, it really wasn't a choice. I mean, the ex I, I mean, I guess that's what it's like when you get your calling. It's just a little hard for me to imagine that uh, you know, being a CPA or a city planner or something like that could seize you by the ears with the kind of intensity that this seized me. I mean, I said, I've got to understand this stuff. This is the most amazing thing. And the, and the second most amazing thing was that nobody seemed to know about it. I mean, I couldn't understand why there weren't 11 inch high headlines on every newspaper on the planet saying, you know, doorway to hyperspace discursion, <laughs> elf negotiations proceeding, uh, something like that. No, apparently it was a, a private mystery or uh, known but to a very few. And I immediately after coming down was seized by an absolutely messianic desire to expose other people to this and see what they said because it just seemed so important to share it. So uh, that's basically what I've been doing ever since and trying to draw conclusions trying to understand what is this, number one, how is it that it can coexist with the world of George Bush, and not uh, be discussed, or not be part of the mix of social concerns. I mean, after all, we're a society where people jump out of airplanes on weekends because their lives are so boring and empty. Well, then, if you think jumping out of an airplane is a thrill to write home about, you should try this stuff. No one would jump out of an airplane if they had DMT on their menu. Uh, but no, apparently it isn't about that. Well, then I, I came to feel that it was, it is, and I still sometimes offhandedly refer to it like this, that it is secret. It is not a secret. It is the secret. There is a secret, and this is it. It is the secret that the world is not only not the way you think it is. It's that the world, the way the world is, is a way that you can't think it is because you simply do not have the imaginative capacity to conceive of such overwhelming peculiarity. And uh, how this secret is able to coexist with the rest of mundane <coughs> reality, maintain its integrity, and not become the object of pogrom, religion, hysteria, and repression is uh, part of <coughs> the mystery of what the secret is. You see, a secret is not something untold. It's something which can't be told. And even as I sit here, I realize that I'm obliquely approaching it 
no matter how weird I say it is, no matter what scintillating metaphor I create to attempt to beguile you into imagining what you can't imagine, I'm perfectly aware that I'm falling short of the goal. I'm creating a symbol of what it is. But frankly, words fail, and I'm a word kind of guy. So then, uh, the rest of my life can be basically poured into a nutshell. It's just been uh, a lot of wandering around in various uh, fringy places, talking to a lot of fringy people, and trying to figure out what is the real importance of this for me personally, because that's where I'm living, obviously, and for everybody else, because I assume that there is absolutely nothing extraordinary about me. I didn't have these experiences because I'm in the lineage of Ramana Maharshi or some malarkey like that. I had that experience because I'm a human being. And every human being can have this experience. Uh, the only analogy I can make to it is sexuality. I notice that no one here seems to be having sex at the moment, <laughs> but uh, we all are shaped by it. Probably this is something so taboo and not necessarily scripted into your biological functioning the way sex is, so taboo that you can go from birth to the grave and never encounter this. Not only can you do that, but most people do. And throughout history, most people have. They never had an inkling. You know, they may have set armies marching, they may have launched empires, they may have built fantastic uh, uh, inventions, painted amazing paintings, created phenomenal works of literature, but they were wet behind the ears when it comes to the full spectrum of reality because without this in the picture, half the world is missing. Well, so then, how to come to terms with this? What is it? The answer is, who knows? We're not doing a very good job of coming to terms with this. Uh, governments inveigh against drugs of all sorts, but largely because these things uh, are uh, sources of difficult-to-tax revenue. It's not the metaphysical concern for the health of your teleological structures that drives uh, the government to repress these things. It's simply the wish not to be chiseled on the center. <laughs> so uh, this, there it is, sideways to the rest of life. Huxley once said of the psychedelic experience generally that it was what he called a gratuitous grace. He said it is neither necessary nor sufficient for salvation. In other words, salvation can be attained without these things, whatever salvation is. Uh, discovering, using, and exploring these things does not guarantee you a place in heaven either, whatever a place in heaven means. However, this is uh, a part of this world, a part of this world that you would think the restless, intellect of this world that you would restless, restless, intellect.
Well, and it's hard to put it into words exactly, especially when you try to do it for the first time. Obviously, the difference between a living person and a dead person, there is a way of thinking about that where you would say the difference is a chemical one. In one case, metabolism is going on, in the other case, not. I, I be, am beginning to think that this narrowing of our conscious focus into three dimensions for survival purposes that I mentioned a few minutes ago may have actually cut us off not only from where the game will be next month or, or uh, who stole the chicken, but it also may have cut us off from contact with the after-death world because it has no efficacy in the, the very nitty-gritty blood and muscle problem of day-to-day -day survival. And that what we have discovered in DMT is literally a chemical doorway to the bardo. And that this, I think, is an even more confounding notion than the notion that we are being pheromonally managed by zeta reticulans or something like that. I mean, after all, if that were the case, it would probably just be one of many programs of social manipulation that are administered by some hideous bureaucracy somewhere beyond Agal, and uh, there's careerism and blunders and budget overruns. And in other words, it sort of comes back down into... Uh, that's what, what the problem I have with all extraterrestrial scenarios is the extraterrestrial seems so much like ourselves. Uh, I think probably it's that we are we have found the pharmacological key to the bardo, and that this is going to over, overturn civilization so completely that we might as well just call an end to it and recess the meeting. That uh, and if you ask shamans about this, you say, you know, what is this all about? They, they will tell you, well, we do all our work through ancestor magic. Well, ancestor is a very sanitized term because not too many people, when they hear the word ancestor, realize that we're talking dead people here. So when a shaman tells you he works with the ancestors, he's, talking, he's saying he works with dead people. Well, hmm. uh, if that's the case, then uh, we are close to being able to secure, in a rational sense, the answer to one of the questions that has driven us most buggy in, during, throughout history, which is, is there continuity of something? after the body dissolves. And I am the last person to ever carry this message into society. I was raised Catholic. I rejected it. At age 14, Jean-Paul Sartre, Jean Genet, Friedrich Nietzsche, these were my gods. And I felt, you know, that moral responsibility, existential honesty, demands that we put aside the cheerful fairy tales of more naive levels of culture and that anybody who wants to talk to you about the dear departed and all that is, you know, in the grip of menopausal mysticism or something <laughs> or just hasn't carried out a rational analysis of what he is. The, now, I think, you know, these religions have all made hay out of, and hash, I might add, out of their uh, imagined franchise of the after-death world because they use it to beat you on the head with some moral laundry list of do's and don'ts that's very dear to them. And it can be anything as nuts as that you shouldn't be pork to who knows what.
in all sides of the world and has only been thrown into question by the scientific uh, high-tech democracies in the last 500 years or so, and for them only among a secular educated elite, the premise that is that there is something that persists beyond life. And I think that uh, part of the uh, profligate irresponsibility of modern life arises from the fact that we don't think we have dues to pay. We don't think, we think there's an easy way out and that you can be a jerk and then just become food for worms and nobody will ever get on your case about it. <laughs> and so moral relativism has come into play. But if in fact we are securing in some form the notion that the human personality or some portion of it persists after death and that there is an ecology of souls and that we must in some sense share this planet with them because after all when you smoke DMT you don't go anywhere physically you simply see your nearby environment from a different dimension through different eyes then it means that we represent a tiny minority of the human beings who care about this planet. We, the living, are just a tiny slice of who cares and who is active in the situation. And somehow we are being, uh, through chance, which I don't believe in, or through design, which seems everywhere around us, we are being brought up short and told that uh, in order for the earth to survive, we must join everyone else in this other place. And that it is not to be conceived of as dissolution, it is to be conceived of as disembodied. This is the only thing I can figure out that is going on. There is some kind of project underway to transfer the lump of living into the realm of the grateful dead. And uh, the anxiety that we feel about death is the anxiety, is an anxiety born essentially of ignorance. And this ignorance is understandable because we have suppressed, repressed, and denied shamanism the leadership role that it should have in metaphysics of all sorts. And so now, we're about to become extinct. And uh, you can like it or you can not like it. You can decry it as the greatest tragedy ever to befall us or this planet, although I suspect the planet will heave an enormous sigh of relief. <laughs> but there is a perspective in which it can actually be seen as progress, that we are all at once going to transit into this bardo realm. Now, this may not be it. It may not be a simple die-off. It may be that somehow a dialogue can be set up with these um, souls or their representatives or whatever they are in this other place and that a world can be established which is neither quite theirs nor quite ours. In other words, that the difference between being alive and being dead, which seems to us fairly fundamental, could in fact turn out to be fairly minor and erasable, or the boundary could be moved from where it is to somewhere else. Uh, we, this stuff is hackle raising in its weirdness, but if you're going to be true to the content of the experience, then I think you're pushed in these kinds of directions. And the, the attractor at the end of history that seems to be pulling 
the human world certainly if not all of space and time into its domain is uh, in the act of realizing itself going to obliterate the kind of distinctions that we have grown used to excuse me even on such fundamental issues as life and death that's the grandest conception that I've been able to come up with and it doesn't require friendly altruistic extraterrestrial flying in from fatal Jews and it doesn't uh, involve nanotechnological downloading of everybody into a gold deterbium cube buried on the back side of the moon and it doesn't uh, involve the human enterprise simply becoming a uh, a layer in shale somewhere in the strata of the paleontological record of life on this planet. It is, you know, a fitting denouement for the mess that we have wandered into. It does require unlimbering of the imagination to come to terms with this because we are in great denial over the possibility that the world could really be transforming itself. I mean, about as far as most of us can go without getting metaphysically uncomfortable is to embrace recycling and population control. But I doubt that such cheerful uh, diddling <laughs> with the machinery will be able to swerve us from our path. I think, uh, like it or not, we are going into a world that we literally, as we sit here, cannot conceive of. A world so different from ordinary reality that to discuss whether we will be alive or dead in that world is mere quibbling. There's one point I wanted to clar clarify real quick. I didn't see this launching of the alien psychedelic explore templates as a bureaucratic enterprise. I almost always envisioned it as a real provisional underground thing to be done by a small minority of shamans in a, in a you know, desperate hope to somehow, you know, propagate their, their, their you, origins. You mean alien shamans? Yeah, yeah. It could be that. I, I, I think... I, I sense a crisis in the physics of the matrix itself. In other words, I think that this is not only happening to human beings. I'm serious when I say, you know, there's only 20 years of history left and we still have half of it to do. We're going to have to do some pretty fast stepping. I mean, what we took 50,000 years to do, we must now do in 20 years. Uh, I think that that space and time and the physical body and the planet and that everything is essentially some kind of an illusion. It's not real. What is real, what is truly bedrock, of it, and I guess this comes close to being a Buddhist position, this is all provisional. This is not what the universe is. The universe is something else. You know, the Buddhists have a doctrine that uh, if a single person will attain enlightenment, then the illusion will collapse instantly all beings will be sucked into the post-enlightenment state and the illusion of space and time of becoming an entity will all be obviated at the snap of a finger well we tend to disbelieve this because no matter how metaphysical we are or we may even call ourselves Buddhists we really believe that Andromeda is 250,000 light years away. I mean, we can't conceive of a light year, but we actually believe that what the scientists tell us. And yet, my God, when you start, uh, when you start carrying all out a critique of modern science, you cannot believe what flux 
this stuff is, is built on. I heard an analogy recently which I thought was very interesting. Our entire picture of the, dis- of the so-called distant universe is built up uh, by the science of radio telescopy, the use of radio telescopes to study deep space. This science has been in existence since about 1950. If you were to take all the radio signals that have been analyzed by uh, radio astronomy since 1950 and characterize them as energy, it would be the amount of energy that is released by a cigarette ash falling a distance of two feet. So this is the thinness of the data out of which we have created these incredibly uh, grandiose conceptions of what is happening. Uh, Science is just whistling past the graveyard. Don't forget that the telescope is about 500 years old this year. So to believe, you know, that that the story science tells us is true when we can't understand the mathematics, we cannot build the instruments ourselves, we cannot analyze the data. I mean, we are uh, under the thumb of a priesthood more uh, domineering, more removed from the ordinary concerns of ordinary people than any priesthood of any religion in the past ever was. I think we should hold all that... um, in abeyance. I'm not saying it's not true. I'm saying it's not possible to tell whether it's true or not. One thing psychedelics will do for you, for sure, is to convince you that what's real is what I call the felt presence of immediate experience. That's what's real. You know, what you think, what you feel, what you see now is what's real. Even your own memories are so shifting and elusive and subject to psychological transformation based on your own inner and unconscious dynamics and kinks that to believe what somebody else is telling you about the temperature of Betelgeuse or something like that or the charge of the top quark means you're just, you've moved off into some kind of private Idaho. Crazy people (laughs) rave about stuff like this. But I think people who are rooted in uh, a good philosophical method will not give much credence to anything out of reach of their good right arm. And the psychedelic experience is an experience. No, I didn't present you with a set of tensor equations or a tape of, uh, of uh, electromagnetic data interpreted through the fiat of a fishy formula. We're talking experience here. And this experience, if made commiserate with ordinary experience, I think leads to the conclusion that This is, I said this the other night, um, this is as dead as you'll ever be. This is as low as you can go. This is as confined a mode of existence as it's possible to know. And it's all up from here, folks. It's a kind of Gnostic vision. it it sees uh, our present circumstance as uh, the low rung of a ladder of transformational um, distillation. And, uh, you know, we come from we know not where. I mean, we have, yes, the details on the fertilization of the egg by the sperm and so forth and so on, but where are the forms comes from. We don't know. This is the mystery of morphogenesis. And then where the form goes to, we do not know. I mean, I I now think that the proper way to think about biology is biological objects, plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, amoebas, and human beings. Biological objects are 
hyperdimensional object. You can tell that that's true because whenever you, what is the sine qua non of a biological object? Meaning, uh, what is the thing it must have to be biological? It must metabolize. That's the essence of life. The form is stable but the matter and the energy which compose the form are in constant cycling. Uh, the form stabilizes, but the energy is flowing through it, which stabilizes it. Well, when we use phrases like cycling through it, flowing through it, these are words which imply a temporal dimension. If you have a chair and you cut into it, it doesn't bleed, it doesn't squirm away, it doesn't begin to rot and fall over. If you cut into an, a, a living object, it undergoes all kinds of changes. This is because you have destroyed one of the dimensions necessary for its manifestation, the temporal dimension. The living body has a relationship to time which the chair doesn't have. The chair is born along in the stream of time. The biological object is made of time itself as much as it's made of space and matter. And so, really what birth is, is the descent of this mysterious entity called the form into matter. It clothes itself with matter and energy through a process of gestation unfoldment, separation from the environment of gestation and unfoldment, which is the mother's body, and then it has an autonomous existence. But what is generally true of true of all life in the phylogenetic in the I'm sorry, in the ontogenetic expression, what's true is that it has finite duration. Everything dies the individual dinosaur, the individual elephant, the individual human being, they die. That means that the form eventually withdraws itself from the domain of matter and energy, and it then presumably exists as it existed before, having added whatever adumbrations three-dimensional experience has given to it. So I've come to see the body as basically the placenta of the soul. And, you know, that's a way of thinking about it that makes dying not so terrifying. I mean, it's as terrifying as smoking DMT, but it's nothing to claw the walls about. The body is the placenta of the soul for the individual. Well, then it's just a short step to realizing that we are now called upon as a species to abandon the body. The body uh, is the, the collective body is the collective placenta of the species and you don't do a war dance around the placenta. Once it serves its function which t is to bring the forming fetus to the point where it can exist and sustain itself in the dimension for which it is destined in the case of ordinary birth that's three-dimensional space and time in the case of this metaphor it's the hyperspace beyond space and time once we are ready to exist in that dimension it's time to undergo the journey down the birth canal and bury the placenta under the old apple tree and forget it and move on. And, uh, you know, I grant you the, the analogy isn't perfect. I mean, where is the midwife? Where is the waiting bassinet? But perhaps the answer to that is the midwife is waiting in these intimations of the, of the friendly alien presence. It may be an aspect of humanness that awaits us just over the great divide. And so we are going to have to uh, 
you know, I, I think that probably now at every talk I give, I make the analogy <coughs> to birth. That this is what we in the 20th century are experiencing. The 20th century is analogous to the birth canal of human history. And so, you know, the wonderful swim in the amniotic ocean is over. The, the fool's paradise of, of uh, the fetal life is ending. Now, the walls are literally closing in. We can't get enough oxygen. We're using up our food. The walls are strangling us. There's no room on this planet for all of us. And for us, it's a catastrophe. But I imagine when a woman goes into transition, that the fetus, if it's not a metaphysician, must be fairly alarmed by the situation. He must just say, well, I guess this is it. It's all over. I'm going to be strangled, suffocated, and simultaneously <coughs> choked to death in this situation. It would take a far-seeing fetus indeed to embrace the journey down the birth canal as the road toward, uh, you know, a split-level ranch house in the hills <laughs> above Malibu if you play your cards right. <laughs> Surely that gets the idea across. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Could you say more about your content of your experience? I was really fascinated. Um, and it seemed like there were some qualities to it that I wanted to know, hear more about. Well, uh, sure. Um, DMT, if you take it orally, is destroyed by enzymes in your gut, so it has to be smoked unless you have a chemical strategy for inactivating those enzymes. So assuming you smoke it, it comes on in about 30 seconds, and if you're a leather-lunged hashashin, you can maybe get it in one swell foot but it takes most people about three hits. And uh, the first thing you notice is that um, it's as though all the air has been drawn out of the room you're in. Suddenly the colors come forward and the edges sharpen. This is really happening. It has... Uh, an extraordinary effect at low doses on visual acuity. So does psilocybin. And then you close your eyes. You feel very peculiar. A kind of anesthesia sweeps through your body, a kind of numbing and yet a sense of a building bubble of energy. Uh, you close your eyes, and after a few seconds, you see forming in front of you what I call the chrysanthemum. It's a floral mandala, usually in yellow and orange, most people say. And it's, it's slowly turning. It's like a wall, but it's a hallucination. But it's right here, right in front of you. And you watch it for about 15 seconds. If it stabilizes, you need one more hit. But what usually happens is that after about 15 seconds of contemplating this thing, it's as though suddenly whatever was holding you back, the cable is cut, and you are just propelled through this membrane. And there is, you hear a sound like a bread wrapper being crumpled, a cellophane bread wrapper being crumpled and thrown away, or the crackling of flames. This is, according to a friend of mine, your radio intellect exiting the anterior fontanelle at the top of your head. <laughs> but he could be wrong. <laughs> but whatever it is, and then you hear a tone, which is, it could be reproduced on a synthesizer. It's that... 
you know, and but it keeps going and becomes hypersonic, supersonic, subsonic, I don't know. Uh, and you, there is a sense of a, literally a membrane is ruptured and now you're there. And what happens to me is the first thing I hear is a cheer, a yell of greeting. It's on, the, on their second album, the Pink Floyd have a song in which they sing, the, the gnomes have a new way to say hooray. <laughs> well, you break into this gnome mess, and it's a very specifically characterized place. It is domed. It's indirectly lit, not brightly lit, but it's softened lighting of some sort. It's comfortable, and but the but all of that is hard to focus on and relatively inconsequential because the main thing that's happening is these things come bounding towards you <coughs> like greyhounds, and there are many of them. These jeweled, self-dribbling, transforming basketballs, which look like iridescent electric radiolaria or something. I mean, they are diatomaceous neon transforms made of syntax or some damn thing like that. And they come toward you, and the, the you have to deal with yourself in this situation because most people in my reaction is absolute amazement complete hysterical disbelief i mean you just say you know my god what is happening it's it comes so quickly that it isn't like a drug where you know you deep breathe and you close your eyes and you wait for an hour and you slowly summon it out of its crevice. It, it's not like that. It's like you were struck by lightning. In fact, some people think they have been struck by lightning, that they never got to the drug, that just as they raised it to their lips, they were struck by lightning, or a jet fighter fell out of the sky, or something. And then you have to ask yourself, is this okay? because it's so radical and it happens so quickly and your eyes are wide open and you don't see anything recognizable. Three-dimensional space, the room you were in, everything, it's gone. Instead, this place, and, and then they tell you, they try to reassure you, although they're not very reassuring. What they say is, don't give way to amazement. Don't abandon yourself to wonder. Basically, don't be a jerk and a rube, you know. Uh, pay attention. Pay attention to what is happening. And then they proceed to do a very intense form of teen teaching. They come <coughs> bounding up. They present themselves. They also do this weird thing where they jump into your chest and then they jump back out. So you're having this sucking in and out of your body thing. They jump in and out of your chest, and they are singing and squeaking and squealing in some kind of elf glossolalia, which you can see. This is very important. They speak a language which you look at, you don't hear. And they make objects which are like s super puns of some sort, in that the object is not one thing. It is somehow several things simultaneously. The way a pun attains its effect by being simultaneously more than one thing. But these are not verbal puns. These are objectified puns in three-dimensional space. And they're funny. And the whole thing is pervaded by... A, the word zany is what I use. It's a form of humor. It's a form of merriment 
but you can't entirely relax around it because you can't entirely be sure that you're getting the joke. Uh, so it's like it's a humor with an edge to it. And uh, they are showing you these jeweled, I've compared them to Fabergé eggs, and when they show you these things, you, you can tell by looking at them that if you could bring a single one of these objects, no larger than an orange, into this world, it would end the debate. I mean, all you would have to do is show it to somebody, and they would say, that's impossible, but yet it's happening, so therefore my reality is dissolving. I'm, I mean, it's somehow to gaze upon these objects is to be forever corrupted for ordinary consciousness. Make them with their voices. These objects are quasi-alive. The objects themselves can sing and make other objects. So you're just being, you're like in this, um, a cross between Santa's workshop, Tiffany's, and the basement of the Metropolitan Museum, and they're offering you all this, this time. There's, I've somehow stretched the thread too tightly, and now I'm never going to make my way back. And they're saying, no, no, can that, that's not what's happening, this is what's happening, pay attention, look, look, look. And then it just fades very suddenly, and they sense it coming. They have urgency because they know the window is tremendously narrow. And in the final moments, in some cases, I recall, they, they, they literally, it, re it recedes away, or you pull away from it, and they say, déjà vu. <laughs> and and then you're you you open your eyes and you're in the room you left. It's like a thousand mics of LSD or something. You are more loaded than you have ever been in your life, and you immediately proclaim, "My God, I'm completely down." And you know the walls are rubbery. The Persian carpet is crawling around. Your friends have faceted faces and look like they just climbed out of one of Billy Myers' starships. But you're absolutely, completely down. You accept this as ordinary. It's all you can do to keep from kissing the good earth. Because where you were was so much removed from that that there is no comparison. Well, now after doing this a number of times, because the first time you do it, the goal is pretty much to live through it. I mean, it's like being shot out of it. I read, I think it was Tim Leary's metaphor. He said it's like being shot out of a cannon with Baroque barreling, and afterwards people want you to draw the barreling when what you were trying to do was live through the experience. But after you do it many, many times, 10, 15, it depends on how bright you are and how able to resist freaking out you are. Uh, my impression became, and this is astonishing to me based on what I've said so far, this is someone, someone very strange. It's someone's idea of a reassuring environment for a human being. This place you end up, which is the weirdest place you could ever conceive of or imagine, has been specifically designed by someone to be as mundane, ordinary, and like this world as they could possibly make it. Not only that, the impression that I have is the vibe of this place, if you will, is it's a nursery. It's a playpen, in fact. And these toys, these things, these elves, are nothing more than the equivalent of stringing a string of colored plastic objects over a bassinet. They're to teach you spatial relationships and hand-eye coordination. You are briefly in uh, 
a nursery for receiving human beings who have just crossed over from hyperspace. Well, imagine if all you knew about this world was a nursery and a maternity ward or a home somewhere, and you were trying to deduce the nature of the universe from a 30-second visit to a human nursery. That's the kind of position we're in. And I think that is what gave me the, the notion that this has to do with the after-death state. Apparently, one, the soul is literally being born into this other dimension, and the soul is not... It's exactly like this world. When you're born into this world, you're just a little worm of a thing, you know? You have to be held by your mother, you have to be swaddled, you have to be kept away from bright lights, breezes, men with cigars, and so forth. And the soul, as it transits into that place, it, you immediately meet the extended existence of your soul in an entirely new domain. Yeah. You mean stayed in that yeah. place? No. Um, and it seems to me unlikely that anyone would, would, because interesting, interesting about the MP is that it has, uh, it occurs naturally in the human brain. We all make it all the time. And so, in a sense, this is not a drug at all. This is a human metabolite that you're getting a tremendous overdose of. But the fact that it occurs naturally in the human brain means that you have chemical pathways, biosynthetic pathways, that uh, can deal with it. That's why it lasts so short a time. One way of talking about the toxicity of a drug is to ask the question, how long before you feel perfectly normal after taking this drug? If you have a drug that 24 or 48 hours after you take it, you still have lower back pain and you're lying in warm baths and avoiding ringing telephones and don't want to talk to anybody, that's a toxic drug. I don't care whether it's coke, methadone, or LSD, you shouldn't. That's not good. DMT, if, uh, 10 minutes, within 10 to 15 minutes after taking it, you not only are down, you can't tell you did it. There's no residuum, no lingering headache, no dryness of mouth, no dilated pupil, nothing. It's like you took an ice cube and hurled it into a blast furnace and then you went looking for it 15 minutes later. It's not to be found. It ain't there. Well, this is amazing because this is the strongest psychedelic there is. You'd think that you'd have to put ice packs on your head for a week after this experience and instead it's completely gone. So. Rupert and I, in talking about this, he developed the idea of what he called a necrotic compound. He thinks that DMT, that at death, you're, you flood your system with DMT, that this, this is what these pathways exist for, and that it sets you up for, for dying, and that uh, if you can, and, and I gave DMT once to a Tibetan Lama who, a very old one, not one of these alcoholic fundraising lamas, <laughs> the real thing, the real thing, and the uh, guy took it like a man, he was probably 92, and afterwards he said, it's the lesser life. He said, you can't, he said, if you go further, you can't return. That's the limit. Beyond that, there is no fail-safe. And he was perfectly matter-of-fact about it, and I took him at his word. I mean, 
if anybody should have known this was the dude and um, I think it's a tremendous argument for hope and you see it's not only an argument for hope it means that if we could get the well the infantile shit-brained drug-phobic yahoos <laughs> sent back to wherever it is that they are going to be sent to practice their family values, <laughs> then we could actually do significant research and find out what's going on here. It's an object of legitimate research. We don't have to genuflect in front of this like it's a religious mystery and will always be unknowable. In principle, what we need to do is you explore this dimension the way you explore any unknown dimension. You send people of great courage and descriptive uh, skill in and with their notebooks, their telescopes, their tape recorders, or whatever is the equivalent for this job, and then you find out what it is. And uh, I think that the, you know, the destiny of the species may be... Um, spun into this it may not be it may be that this transition into hyperspace is not as inevitable as I previously assured you it may be that we have to do something on this side we have to meet them halfway through the mountain they're boring toward us we have to alert ourselves to the fact that a tunnel is possible and then get cracking you know with dynamite, which is uh, an analogum for DMT. Yeah. Terrence, um, can you go into briefly say something about um, the distinction now between what you have spoke about the last ten minutes um, with uh, the distinction between uh, the Fabergé eggs and uh, basketballs and self-transforming machine elves? And that that you, that one may occur by going into the Amazon canopy and experiencing some type of preparation prepared by the natives is that organically mixed um, earthly based uh, high similar to the synthesized DMT? Now I have taken DMT many many years ago, but it would seem that that the natives may describe it at least in a much different fashion than yourself. Um, what is the distinction? And then, and then also, if you can hit on after that, uh, the distinction between that and psilocybin. Well, the difference is not as great as maybe your question implies. First of all, the, the thing that is so interesting about DMT is if the only requirement is that you be able to hold the toke and if you cough and lose it then it's murky and mucked up uh, in the case of ayahuasca which is what you're asking about it's a, it's a well I'll explain to the group remember how I said the DMT is destroyed in your gut so you have to smoke it but then I added the caveat that unless you uh, somehow inactivate this enzyme system in your gut, which will destroy it, the DMT. Well, it turns out there's a way to do that. The enzyme system is called monoamine oxidase, and there are compounds called monoamine oxidase inhibitors. If you take a monoamine oxidase or MAO inhibitor, then and follow it with oral DMT then the DMT will not be destroyed in your gut it will actually be absorbed into the lining of the small intestine a large intestine and then passed into the bloodstream and you will have a psychedelic intoxication well in the Amazon this has been understood by the shamans for a long long time and so they take two plants one Banisteriopsis capi a large woody vine a twining liana 
and it actually contains a powerful short-acting monoamine oxidase inhibitor and they take this vine and they pulverize it and they uh, combine it in a large pot of water with the leaves of another plant which contains DMT it may be one of several plants it's usually Cicotria viridis then they boil these two things together and then for hours and then they pour the water off and save it in a in a jug and put fresh water on this com this mess of two different plants and boil it again for hours and then they pour the two water fractions together and they get rid of all the solid matter they throw it away it's now been cooked for six to eight hours and they take this watery fraction several gallons and they drive it down over a hot fire until they get something a, a, a dark brown thick liquid that is truly horrifying uh, to ingest because the taste is so ghastly because all the salts and sugars and God knows what else have been concentrated into this stuff but this is now a, a beverage a liquid I love it that in the literature they call it a psychoactive beverage <laughs> <laughs> and when you drink it the the compound from the from the woody vine, harmine, inhibits the MAO uh, and, uh, and the DMT passes through and enters the bloodstream and instead of a 10 minute experience that reaches the apex of intensity in two minutes, you get an experience which is drawn out, stretched out over about four to six hours now usually this is not um, it's a psychedelic experience it's similar to mushrooms in some ways but if you really make it stiff if you really put the pedal to the metal on the amount of Cicotria viridis or DMT containing leaf that you put into this stuff then after about two hours you can slowly by sitting in darkness by practicing breath control you can slowly manipulate it into a place where you then say you know by gosh and begali we've made it to the elf nest here it is so uh, I think that great shamans courageous shamans have always been able to make their way into the presence of this thing but I put the great qualifier in front of the word shaman because in my actual field experience in the Amazon what I discovered was once it got you loaded <coughs> enough to be comparable to say four grams of mushrooms most of these guys would look at you in horror if you suggested that it was only twice as strong as it should be. There, the shamans all over the world are have an ambivalent attitude toward these dimensions they go into. Very few just hurl themselves delightedly into complete boundary dissolution. I had a guy tell me once, he said, you think just because we run around wearing penis sheaths that this stuff is easy for us to do? Well, I've got news for you. It's as hard for us as it is for anybody. It's hard for human beings to surrender to something so strange. I could never get ayahuasca to carry me into the DMT mess until I made it myself. And then, with nobody, you know, holding my elbow and keeping me, telling me how much poetry of the ribbon I should put in, I was uh, able to jack it up and jack it up until finally it was truly horrifyingly strong. And that's what you want. I mean, we're not interested in uh, colored lights and dancing mice here. <laughs> um, so, 
Now let me see. Did I cover the waterfront? No. Comparison to DMT, to psilocybin. Psilocybin, in that uh, you explained one time in one of the past lectures that the earth or UFO type images that appear from the psilocybin is supposed to be more earthly, mother of goddess connection of the uh, ayahuasca. But I think if you push the ayahuasca hard, it all begins to migrate in this direction. Psilocybin, you know, I advocate five dried grams in silent darkness. Eight five, eight dried grams in silent darkness will give you the indistinguishable from a DMT flash. The problem is, you know, one thing about DMT that is both frustrating and liberating is that it's so brief. Basically, it's like a roller coaster. The, the, the great consolation is this is only going to last for five minutes. If you climbed on a roller coaster of super intensity and as they dropped the bar over your lap, they said, oh yeah, this is the four-hour <laughs> trip. <laughs> and then you would say, well, you know, hold on. It hand. does appear, though, that by IV, which is mostly how I did it years ago, it, that it seemed that it was extended to about 30 to 40. IV DMT? Yeah. Do you mean that you, you shot it intravenously? You don't mean that it was a, a, a perfusion pump situation? No. No. <laughs> well, see, I've talked to, to people who've done research on DMT, and a surprising conclusion that comes out of those discussions is that shooting it is not as intense as smoking it. Shooting it... <laughs> well, yeah, it sounds fairly intense, but people who do both say shooting it can't lay a candle to. And the re and this is a funny thing, if I'll just mention it as an aside. Drug researchers love to shoot drugs into their experimental subjects. They love the syringe as the route of administration because you all you get better numerical data because you can measure the dose absolutely and then you hit them and you know they got it if you smoke something you may you know obviously when you can hold your breath no longer and you exhale smoke comes into the room that's not part of your dose and sometimes there's a residuum in the bottom of the pipe that's not part of your dose. So in the name of precision, people who've done research on DMT have always shot it. Even the recent study out at the University of New Mexico, it was by injection. I tried to persuade them to do a section with smoking, but this argument for numerical precision carried the day. But the effect of relying on intravenous injection like that is that no one in the clinical situation has ever observed or experienced the flash that I'm talking about. I don't think you can attain it except by uh, smoking. You know, how about the penis snuffs? No, I've done those. And uh, that is, um, uh, you know, well, tell the truth, let the chips fall where they may. Highly overrated Be for several reasons. First of all, um, you have to snuff close to a tablespoon of these toasted and powdered uh, if Anadonanthra peregrina seeds, and there's a lot of cellulose there. And so you do not absorb it instantly. The other thing is it's so physically unpleasant to do it that there's a tendency to hit to cut low on the dose because when the, the standard method of administering edema is you have a hollow reed, like a bamboo reed about this long, you fill it with this powdered toasted saga essentially, that has been reduced to flour. And uh, you get up on your haunches, 
and your friend comes over and you put the tube up your nostril and he blows. He takes a huge lung full of air and he just blows as hard as he can. Well, the effect is like being hit in the face with a two by four. I mean, you stagger backwards, you salivate, it's intensely painful, you scream, you squirm around in the dirt, and then you get back up on your haunches, and by that time he has loaded the tube for the second nostril. And then the whole thing happens all over again, except now you're salivating, your eye is swollen up, your sinuses are filled with this gunk, and you do it again, same thing, scream, squirm in the dirt, so forth and so on. Then you stagger over out of the sun into the shade and sit with this with his saliva just pouring out of your mouth. And after about five minutes you begin to drift into a, a psychedelic state of some sort. But there is no sense of a rush, of a splitting of the world into two halves. It's uh, not an effective route of administration. Well, how about the, what do they call the chorus spirits? Oh, well, once That's they get... Once they get intoxicated, then they play this strange game, which is almost characteristic of this white uh, Yanomamo cultural group. Guys square off. They stand about three feet apart from each other, and by some means, the equivalent of tossing a coin, it's been decided who will go first. So the guy who goes first is totally loaded on this stuff and he has mucus running out of his nose, saliva running out of his mouth, his eyes are swollen, practically swollen shut. He pulls back his hand and he hits the other guy right in the center of the chest as hard as he can. So the guy either loses his feet or doesn't anyway, he grunts like a bull and stands there. He also is in the same state. Then he pulls back, and then he does it. And they keep doing this until somebody is knocked off their spot. And the, when you interview them later about this, what you're told is your ability to stand on your spot depends on how many of these Hakuli spirits you have inside your chest. And so... They, this is some kind of Yanomamo psychology meeting the raw data of the DMT experience. I, I don't know what they're talking about, but it has something to do with the DMT things that jump in and, in and out of your chest when you smoke it. They believe that the, 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 the de- they say the demon from the tree will live in your chest. And the more of these tree demons inside your chest you have, the more physically able to resist being knocked off your spot you are, and the more shamanically empowered you are. But this goes to a point I often make with my groups, which is, you know, one one ethnic group or one culture's drug is another person's pain in the neck. You know, I mean, I've taken awful drug that the people after it was over with they would you'd say you know God you guys do this all the time it's really kind of uh. and they say yeah well it takes getting used to and we really don't do it all that often only ceremonies and you're right most people are glad to get it over with and go back to the palm beer <laughs> uh, so your experience is basically that it's too caveman like it's very hard on the system biologically and it makes it so that the time that you could be having in exploring these strange dimensions is somehow inhibited yeah i don't think i don't think in the bina taking situation that you ever get enough all at once to the synapses in sufficient concentration to deliver you over into what I'm describing occurring on the... Now, if you took ayahuasca and did the stuff, 
right after you drank ayahuasca. Strangely enough, though, those cultural groups do not overlap. You know, where there is ayahuasca, there is never Athena. Where there is Athena, if there is ayahuasca, there never is. There's no ethnography done right now on that. That may be an area where someone wants to explore by bringing in non-indigenous sources of ayahuasca into the Yanomamo area. Well, people are, you know, traditional people are surprisingly conservative. I mean, I've sat with ayahuascaros and done their brew and talked to them about DMT, and then they say, well, describe it. And so then I will describe it as I described it to you here. And then my best guy said, well, I don't know, it sounds a little intense. Uh, I think I'll take a pass on it. Uh, you know, and he was my mentor in the domain of ayahuasca. It, it's pretty stout stuff. I think that, you know, shamans have always, you know, looked over the fence, looked through the keyhole, stepped through the doorway. But I think DMT, pure crystal DMT, or ayahuasca specifically brewed to reality obliterating doses, uh, is the only way you can approach this place. Yeah. I'm wondering, on the experience you talk about your being caught, mention that, yes. Again, uh, yeah, the second part would be how ha- have you done this? I've done it maybe 30 times. I haven't done it for a couple of years. DMT or DMT? No, DMT. I'm... I'm uh, Sometimes I think it's a young man's game, or sometimes I'm just getting chicken shit, you know. It's, this is not a drug of abuse, let me tell you. <laughs> I know people who say it's their favorite drug, and you say, well, when was the last time you did it? And they say 1968, <laughs> and they're still processing to feel no need to go back and have a second look. What was your the first part of your question? What kind of knowledge? Ah, uh, the knowledge. The knowledge is interesting. The knowledge is they want you, they want me to make language that you can see. They they absolutely are convinced that this ability to make things visible with sound can be taught. And that's what they want you to do. They demonstrate it. They say, see what we're doing? See what we're doing? Now do it! And you say, but, but, and say, no excuses. We don't have a lot of time. It's almost over. Do it. Do it. And, and then you attempt to do it, and you discover in that place you can do this. But why this is so important? Because when you come back to this world and listen to tape recordings of yourself doing it, it's gibberish of some sort. It's a kind of neurologically driven glossolalia. It's like, um, you know, it's a language unhinged from the necessity of meaning. And yet, it is true that when you do it in that place, it's absolutely ecstatic. It's, It's like sex, but sex is sort of like a white light kind of thing. This is like a colored spectrum. If you could put the sexual experience through a prism and change the purity of orgasm into a a spectrum of stuff, then it would be like this language. It's pure poetry. It's poetry so thick you can literally cut it with a knife. And they want you to do this. And they are absolutely passionate about this is what we are here to teach you. How to speak in a language that can be seen. And, you know, a language which could be seen would be a kind of telepathy. You know, if you could see what I mean, you would see my thoughts. The way we communicate, small mouth noises, 
and the assumption of shared dictionary, an assumption which is never borne out by careful questioning, is a miserable way to communicate. If we could see our linguistic intentionality, it would be the equivalent of seeing our minds. And so what they, this is what they want us to do. Now, maybe if one were truly dead, they wouldn't be so urgent about it. And they would be like a, a relative leaning over a bassinet and, and holding up objects and saying, look at this, baby. Look at this. This is a bell or something. But the, definitely what they teach is in the domain of language. And it's not a teaching which can be said, like love one another or, you know, if it's juicy, eat it over the sink. It's more an ability locked in your physiological structure that we're not using. They want us to speak in colored light. And it's their agenda, it's not mine. I haven't the faintest idea why that is so compelling to them. Well, that's a little unfair, because I've given a lot of thought to it. But initially, I couldn't figure it out. Um, we'll, I'm sure, get more into this this afternoon. It is the little self-transforming elf machine informs me. Lunchtime. <laughs> Thank you for putting up with this. Uh, I appreciate your uh, silent scorn, or whatever it is. <laughs> so let's...